the seventh Sunday of Easter. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ is gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Could we have our first read? Together the crowd numbered about 120 people and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us throughout the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and a from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Stand for the reading of the Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So, Father, now glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Uh, well, I mean, I, 
do know because I read it. But I'm not sure whether it was the bit I meant to have read or not. But it really doesn't matter that much today because it's about Jesus and that's what we're here for, to be about Jesus. I want to think a bit this morning about what is called Jesus' great high priestly prayer. Oh, like that bit this morning, it's full of complexity and repetitions and presumed closeness to the Father. And as we hear these great solemn words of Jesus, well, we can be left wondering whether we ever really prayed at all. Don't panic. The idea of prayer as the primary method of our interaction with God is, for me, best thought of as a way of life rather than an activity reserved for specific places at specific times and with specific formulae. Now, we do use those specific formulae and they are very comforting to us and the specific place that we are in, we are so glad to be back in. So no one's knocking what we do. But at one time or another, all of us will have had a problem with all of that. Because it only seems to take us so far. I wonder if when St Paul said, pray without ceasing, he really meant that we ought to say prayers without ceasing. Bishop Spong says, when people envision the kingdom of heaven as a place where people are praying all the time, I'd just soon as not go, if that's the reality that we'd have to deal with. Prayer for most of us, perhaps particularly in these pandemic days, is in dire need of a makeover. Tired cliches, rote childhood prayers are the extent of many people's prayer repertoire. Do you remember those prayers that, uh, I, I'm sure are not your children, <laughs> but, but we as children probably remember prayers like this. I mean, it's downright creepy. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. There's nothing going on here. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Oh. Well, it is creepy, isn't it? Many people approach prayer in a way that makes God into a cosmic vending machine. Insert prayer through your slot, make your selection, and if you've been good, voila, that's French. <laughs> you get the outcome you asked for. Only doesn't really work. But there are lots of texts that people can point us to, aren't there, that seem to support such a simplistic understanding of prayer. Whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Sounds clear, doesn't it? That's Matthew. What about Luke? Ask, and it will be given to you. In Luke again, Jesus tells a parable about persistence in prayer. Do you remember the one about the widow and the judge? And she, she badges and badges and badges till he finally gives her what she wants. And that seems to teach us, if we're not careful, that God, if we badger him, will eventually give in in some way. And then we have words of Jesus himself. If two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. What are we to do with this? 
And of course, the problem lies when we've taken all these verses out of their proper context. Far from being willy-nilly guarantees of whatever you want, these verses are all about making the reign of God real on earth through acts of healing, reconciliation and justice. Remember, when the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray, then you are given the Lord's Prayer. And what is that? It is an appeal to God that we may be sustained in doing whatever work is necessary in bringing about the kingdom on this earth. Give us today our daily bread. Yes? Just so that we can do the work. But we've all been guilty of prayer abuse. There's all kinds of abuses these days, aren't there? People don't usually talk about prayer abuse. I hope it's a first. Most people, you see, are uh, what Americans call foxhole prayers. You know what a foxhole is? It's where you hide from the battle before you get your nut shot off. And such people cry out in the midst of disaster, Lord, if only you get me out of this alive, I will do something for you. It's kind of like making deals with God. And if we're not doing that, we're treating the divine like some kind of Santa Claus for adults. I want, I want, I want. Sometimes prayer is confused with magic. Passionately stringing together the proper words and incantations in the hope of conjuring up the power to realise what we want. I feel sorry for whoever is leading the prayers this morning, actually. <laughs> Who is leading the prayers this morning? I hope you're listening. We all know the story next. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. You'll be okay by the end. <laughs> prayers, <laughs> prayers on behalf of others is what we call intercessionary prayer, isn't it? And prayers to solve my problems, or yours, are petitionary prayers. And although they're the type of prayers that people pray all the time, they are dangerous. They're dangerous because people may perceive the divine to be in the reward and punishment business. When the prayers aren't answered, people build them, beat themselves up with guilt because they're obviously not good enough or faithful enough for God to answer yes. And such an attitude is easy to understand when we read from the letter of James, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Oh, I must not be righteous enough then. <laughs> and taken to its logical outcome, this type of prayer assumes the existence up there somewhere of a malleable deity who is obliged to change the direction of the whole world just to please the desires of a supposedly righteous person or two. Most of you, I guess, will have seen the film Bruce Almighty. Jim Carrey's character in the film Bruce is imbued with the power of God. And after several miserable attempts to respond to every individual prayer being sent up to him, he finally succumbs and answers yes to everything. In the pan pandemonium and chaos that follows, it becomes clear that a lot of what people pray for is not healthy, not reasonable, Possibly not even legal. If only I pray hard enough, God will do what I want. People of faith continue to lift up the scripture passages that seem to suggest just pray enough and God will provide. Oh, but come on. 
personal experience and common sense tell us that such claims are simply not so. In two world wars and every other conflict, including the current one in the Middle East, both sides pray to the same God for victory. Concentration camp survivor Elie Wiesel asks, how can I still pray to God after the Holocaust? Let's push it even further. Imagine the victims of a particularly horrible plane crash arriving at the pearly gates to be informed by God, sorry, I would have loved to intervene, but not enough of you were praying. Or the alternative, God reaching down to catch the plane and lightly setting it down upon the earth. Oh, says God, good thing you prayed. What? Neither scenario makes any kind of sense, does it? But, here's the good bit. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a new branch of neuroscience devoted to uncovering the connection between one's mind and one's body. It's called I'm going to have to read it. Psychoneuroimmunology. So there. It explores the effect that our emotional and psychological well-being have an effect upon our immune system. And studies, honestly, studies have proved that people who pray or who are prayed for tend to recover more quickly than those not prayed for. So, pray for healing. Not because you will always get well, but so that you can connect with that still mysterious and natural power of healing. And pray for safe travel. I know I do. Not because God will necessarily catch your plane, but so that you can be prepared for whatever happens when you're on it. Pray for an end to drought. Pray for a job. Pray for or fill in your own blank. But not because prayer is going to control the weather. Not because prayer is going to control some future employer. Not because prayer is going to control anything in the direction you want. Why pray then? So that we can avoid the temptation to despair of God in times of difficulty. But isn't that defeatist? Darkly existential? No. I want us to acknowledge the reality that life is what life is. The Old Testament puts it this way, there is a time for everything under heaven. And that gives a rhythm to being human. Personal experience tells us that rain falls on the just and on the unjust, the good and the bad. And for many, prayer helps in raising an awareness of the divine who shares in both the joys and the sorrows of life. Now, we don't know everything, do we? There is something we don't yet understand about how love connects us. How life is bound together. How all of us are much more interdependent than we really want to be. I say to you that God is the very relationship that binds us together. And somehow we need to open ourselves to that. And when we do, that is a way of loosing God's power in the world. 
I believe that God's power, which is love and life, is always beneficial, always life-enhancing, even therapeutic. So, prayer. The faith we claim as Christians is not an insurance policy against tragedy and loss. God will be with us, no matter what. And as hard as it is for us to fathom it, when we find ourselves stuck like we have been in this pandemic, with very little likelihood that a miracle is on its way, God is with us and stays with us, whether we die or recover. It's a commonplace among faithful Christians of all kinds to believe deep down that if we're good, God will protect us and rescue us from life's difficulties. But being in a relationship with God does not create some kind of divine force field protecting us from harm. Being in a relationship with God strengthens us for living life as it hits us, come what may. In difficult times, when our most heartfelt petitions seem to go unanswered, and maybe we even feel abandoned by the divine, people often wonder what they've done to deserve such a fate. Remember, even Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The experience of faithful people over the ages suggests that God is not, in fact, in charge of dispatching miracles. Instead, the Spirit that fills us the spirit that fills this world longs always to be our intimate companion in our lives. We are in covenant with the spirit that remains with us whatever happens to us along life's journey. You see, it, it's a matter of how you see things. Seldom, if ever, do two people have the same experience and perceive it exactly the same way. If you were watching the cup final yesterday, you would have seen um, the same picture as a Chelsea or a Leicester City supporter, and they would have seen totally different things when that goal was disallowed. Oh my God, am I talking about football again? <laughs> and that's because on the journey through life, we accumulate filters through which we see the world. When I watch Crystal Palace playing Aston Villa at noon today, there won't be any doubt what I see, but I will see the same as an Aston Villa supporter who will totally see something different. So, you know, we are children of our experiences. When a photographer puts a filter on a camera, he changes the look of the scenery. But you don't change the scenery. And so it is with the spiritual life. It's a matter of how you see something. I want to suggest that simply paying attention to life is the key here. People these days call it mindfulness. I've heard so many different descriptions of mindfulness and I can't tell you, uh, partly because my wife is a, a psychotherapist who looks after other counsellors and so on, but they're full of it. Nothing wrong with being full of mindfulness. For me, it means this mindfulness, this praying life, means that instead of rushing through life to get to something else, Try to concentrate intently on every aspect of your life as you come to it, whether it's brushing your teeth, climbing the stairs, or washing dishes. 
because each activity has the potential to centre us in the moment and overcome the tendency to let the self-chatter of our mind drown out an awareness of the now. I know I'm going on a bit, but what I'm trying to get across is that I want us to take life's experiences 